Jeremiah chapter uh, 17 is where we begin here this evening. Jeremiah chapter 17. Um, I look at the clock and I say, man, there might be time for question and answer tonight. So, I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to hurry myself through the text by giving it time. So all, all I can say is uh, text in uh, questions if you have them, and maybe we'll get to them at the end. I, I make no promises, no promises. And, and Lars will figure out who's going to come on up here and ask them. But uh, just, you know, if, if we have time, we'll do it. Okay? Does that sound fair? Father in heaven, we thank you for tonight. And we pray that you give us now illumination. Jesus, I recognize that your Holy Spirit is given to your people in a way under the new covenant that Jeremiah under the old covenant could only foresee in the future. He could not experience it or see it with his own eyes and ears. But Lord, we are on the receiving end of that. So I pray for that work of the Holy Spirit in the life of each individual believer that we might receive from you here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 17, the broad context is the prophet of Jeremiah is speaking to the wicked, to the rebellious southern kingdom of Judah, preparing them for the judgment of God that is to come upon them in some years after his prophecy. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with the point of a diamond it is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of your altars, while their children remember their altars and their wooden images by the green trees on the high hills. O oh, my mountain in the field, I will give you as plunder, your, I will give as plunder your wealth, all your treasures and your high places of sin within all your borders. And you, even yourself, shall let go of your heritage which I gave you. And I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. My well, friends, this is sort of characteristic, right? We've been over similar ground here before in the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah records the repeated warnings of Jeremiah to the people of Judah over many years. Jeremiah had a ministry that lasted decades. And what might seem to us as well, week after week, it's the same kind of thing. These things were spaced out. They were meant to get the attention of the people of Judah at their particular time and their particular place. And why? Because look at what it says there in verse 1. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. What does that mean? What he's getting at is that it is written as if it was chiseled upon stone. A pen of iron with a diamond tip, as it's described there, refers to something that would be engraved into a rock. And here's the simple picture given, is that their sin is deeply ingrained within them. You know, sometimes you'll see an ancient inscription that you can read to this day. Thousands of years later, you can read it. Why? Because it was written, as we would say, written in stone with an instrument of iron. And he's saying, that's how deep your sin is, O oh, Judah. As a matter of fact, he puts it right there in verse 1 where he says, on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of your altar, it's written that deeply into your heart. Two pictures here. Your heart is as stone and your sin is deeply engraved upon it. And friends, I just think this is a, a, a very eloquent and picturesque description of the human condition. Don't we sometimes think that sin and, and, and the, the problems of the human condition are very light, easy affairs? You know, quick fix it kind of things. Just go down to the self-help section of a bookstore. Are there still bookstores anywhere? But you get the idea. Uh, click on the self-help tab of your online bookstore. And just take a look at it and you'll see. Oh yeah, we can help you here. This guy can help you. That guy, yeah, help, 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 everything. And the idea is, oh yeah, this is all fixable. It's all there. We can manage this. Let me tell you something, people. The problems of humanity are written deeply. They're like engraved in stone. And you know where the stone is? It's in the heart of the human condition. That's how God analyzes it. As a matter of fact, notice this. Verse 2 says, 
while their children remember. In other words, because it's so deeply ingrained, it's like a legacy that's passed on from generation to generation. And therefore, as a cause of this, verse four, I will cause you to serve your enemies for all their deeply ingrained sin, especially their idolatry with the wooden images upon the high hills, God promised to bring his judgment upon the people of Judah. Now on to verse five. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Interesting how he puts two situations side by side. First of all, if you notice the first situation is in verse five, cursed is the man who trusts in man. If you put your trust in man, there is an automatic curse that comes upon you because you're going to be disappointed. There is disappointment among one another in the human race. And I don't even know that this curse requires the special activity of God. This curse is simply associated with trust placed on failing and fallible man. Listen, if you're driving a car with no brakes, God doesn't have to put a special curse upon that car for you to get into an accident. And if you're trusting in man, God doesn't have to put a special curse on that dynamic for that to fail you someday. This is just how it works when we put our trust in failable man. Just like it says there in verse six, he shall be like a shrub in the desert. Jeremiah pictured a weak, dry shrub in the desert about ready to die from the drought. And this is the picture of the one whether they be a believer who's trusting in man instead of the Lord or an unbeliever, they're dry, they're unstable, they have no root. Now, friends, I wish I could say that all those who trust in man are outside the church, but is there not an inappropriate level of man trust, so to speak, within the church? Sometimes we find it present in what's sometimes called, and I don't know if it's a great a uh, descriptor for it. And, and actually, I think generally, as I have my eye on the broader Christian culture, which I don't have my eye on it that well, but for whatever it's worth, some people call it celebrity kind of Christianity with celebrity pastors and such like that, which, which seems to me to be on the decline, praise the Lord. But isn't that a way of trusting in man? The friends, our, our trust just in, is in man. It's in the Lord. And even if God should use a man or a woman in a wonderful or remarkable way, still don't put your trust in them. Keep your trust in the Lord. That, that person, me included, is sure to disappoint you somewhere along the way. Now, I don't need a lot of heads nodding. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Oh, we've, we've experienced that, brother. Thank you. But, but listen, it's true, isn't it? Now, again, there's a wrong way for a leader or preacher to do that. Uh, you can't trust in man so I can be as flaky as I want to be and you should have your eyes on the Lord anyway. God forbid that anybody would have such an attitude. But friends, at the end of the day, our trust needs to be in the Lord. Now look at the blessing that comes from putting your trust in the Lord. Verse seven, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters whose leaf will be green. Does that remind you of another passage of scripture? What does it remind you of? Psalm one. There are a few references in the book of Jeremiah which seem to reference Psalm one in a wonderful way. It seems like that was something that was really impressed upon Jeremiah's mind. So you see this contrast. Jeremiah thought trusting in the Lord and trusting in his word was the answer to having an excessive trust in man. Now he goes on here, verse nine, it's really right along the same theme. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Notice what it says there in verse nine. 
The heart is deceitful above all things. Now, friends, trusting your heart, isn't that just another way of putting an inappropriate trust in man? Because you belong to humanity. It's not as if trusting a man means only to trust in other people inappropriately. It can also mean to trust in yourself inappropriately. And when we begin to trust in ourselves and think that our heart is a perfect guide or a measure to all things, if we want to take the number one advice that comes to us from Hollywood and the major media, look, how many themes come out, how many movies come out every year that have the basic theme, follow your heart? <laughs> Friends, following your heart is a recipe for disaster when the heart is deceitful above all things. Now, Jeremiah speaks to this point many times in his book. Just to this point already, uh, Jer let me just read you a few passages. Jeremiah 11, 8. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of his evil heart. That's Jeremiah 11, 8. They prophesied to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Jeremiah 14, 14. Each one follows the dictates of his own evil heart so that no one listens to me, Jeremiah 16, 12. And so he says, listen, the heart is deceitful like no things. Now, I don't think that it's that the, desart, the heart is so wicked, but the heart can deceive us like nothing else because we can trust our heart like nothing else. And friends, we just got to realize that God is greater than our heart. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Don't you remember that passage from the New Testament? Where the apostle argues this, he goes, and if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Listen, we just need to take our cues, first and foremost, from the wisdom and the pattern and the principle of God's word. Because not only is the heart deceitful, it's also, verse 9, desperately wicked. Now, now many people have been led to rebellion and disobedience and sorrow by following their heart when sometimes our heart needs to be challenged and we judge it by the measure of God's truth. Do you understand that it is entirely possible for your heart to desire something that is eminently sinful? It is. I've spoken about this before. To you, but I'll speak about it again just because it fits so appropriately with the passage of Scripture. Many times I've counseled people, and, and a man in a troubled marriage will look me in the eye, and he'll talk about the girlfriend that he's taken up with while his wife cries to the side. And the man will tell me, and, and he'll mean it with everything that's inside of him, but I love this other woman. You know what, I, I believe him, how can I doubt him? You know, there's not like a thermometer I can put in his mouth and measure whether or not he really loves her, I can't tell. So I believe him. But friends, isn't it true though, that your heart can lead you astray on such things? Isn't it true that you can have a genuine love for someone or something that Jesus would say, I tell you to lay it down in obedience to me and die sometimes to the things we love the very most. Friends, this, this, is, just, this is just biblical Christianity. But, but it's a very difficult thing. I, I'm not trying to say this is just biblical Christianity as if I'm saying that it's easy to do. No, I recognize it's very difficult to do. Do you know what it feels like to die to yourself? It feels like you're dying. And that's a horrible feeling. No, it's not easy. But friends, it is fairly simple. And the challenge is in the doing of the thing. Now, when we read verse 9 and see that it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, many people have the question, does that apply to the heart of the believer in Jesus Christ? Well, let me tell you something. For the believer under the new covenant, we have a new heart. Matter of fact, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 is a passage that very eloquently describes the new heart that God will give us under the new covenant. And we know that we're a new creation. 
2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about that. And that we are a new man or new woman patterned after Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.24 tells us that. So let me tell you something. If you are a new creation in Jesus Christ, you are a transformed person. And you have a new heart. The heart of stone has been taken away and God has given you a heart of flesh and that is your identity. However, let me say this. The Bible, in particular the Old Testament, it does not use these references to the inward life with great precision. Basically, it's talking about something inside of me. Uh, Right here where it says here, notice this uh, in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Do you know what it is literally there for mind? Kidneys. It's just talking about the inside stuff. It's not trying to speak with great precision. And while I totally understand that in Jesus Christ, I am a new man and have been given a new heart, and that is my identity, I cannot deny that there is still a sinful impulse inside of me. Now, I have to deal with that. I have to die to it. And what the great teaching of the new life tells me is that sinful impulse inside of me is not the real me. The real me is the new man created according to Jesus Christ and his pattern. But I still have to deal with an inward impulse to sin that needs to be crucified daily before Jesus Christ. So is it true that the Christian has a new heart? Absolutely. But is it also true that the Christian must deal with this inward impulse to sin that that is not your identity, but it's just a residue residue fact within you until your glorification? Yes, that is true as well. But then notice the question of verse 9. Who can know it? I'm glad you asked, because look at verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Knowing your own heart or the heart of others is difficult and sometimes impossible. But God searches and he tests and he knows the heart and the mind. It's wise to trust what God says about us even more than what we think about ourselves. And therefore, look at the end of verse 10. Even to give to every man according to his ways. Because God perfectly knows the heart and mind of man, his judgment is true. God knows exactly what we need and what we don't need, what we deserve and what we don't deserve, what will help and what will hurt. He knows. So don't trust in man. Don't trust in your own heart. Now verse 11, don't trust in riches. As a partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets riches but not by right. It will leave him in the midst of his days and at his end he will be a fool. Don't trust in riches. Why? Because at the end of it all, you can't take it with you. You're never going to be take a bit of it with you. That's it. It's gone. It's done. No, you need something that will matter for eternity, not just for this life. So don't trust in riches. And as well, verse 12, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary O Lord, the hope of Israel, all forsake you will be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Friends, would you just look at that verse with me there, verse 12? A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. We're not going to trust in man. We're not going to trust in our own hearts. We're not going to trust in riches. You know what we are going to trust in? The Lord God who reigns on a throne in heaven. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to find refuge. We're going to find sanctuary at his throne. Can you believe that? His throne is our sanctuary. It's our place of protection. It's our place of rest. That's what God opens up to us. Now, I I don't know. We we in America, we're not really steeped in this whole monarchy thing. We don't get it so much. You know, you you think of a very proud king upon a throne. And there he is with the great big crown and all the fur and all the sergeant at arms and the people all around him. And, you know, you just don't walk in there and go, king, can I hide behind your throne for a few minutes? No, they'll kick you right out. But think about this. Think about the king's son who comes in and wants to hide from the monsters who are bothering him. The king says, come, hide right behind my throne. It's your sanctuary. Friends, 
God's throne becomes our sanctuary because we put our trust in him. Now, when you have that to trust in, why would you trust in man? Why would you trust in your own heart? Why would you trust in riches? And therefore, it makes all the worse this idea of rejecting it. Why he says there in verse 13, those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they've forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. When you've got this great God to trust in and he invites you to come and find your sanctuary at his throne, why would you trust in anything else? Now going on to verse 14. Heal me, Lord. This begins a section where Jeremiah prays. Heal me, Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. Indeed, they say to you, they say to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hurried away from being a shepherd who follows you, nor have I desired the woeful day. You know what came out of my lips. It was right there before you. Do not be a terror to me. You are my hope in the day of doom. You see, in contrast to the foolish people of Judah who were trusting in man, their own hearts and in riches, Jeremiah says, no, Lord, I put my trust in you. If you heal me, I'll really be healed. If you save me, I'll truly be saved. I'm crying out unto you for these things, God, and you, verse 14, will be my praise. Matter of fact, he says, As for me, I'm not going to turn away from these things. I'm not going to turn away from being a shepherd. I'm not going to, I like what he says there in verse 16, nor have I desired the woeful day. Did you see that line? (laughs) Friends, Jeremiah prophesied a lot of gloom and doom, did he not? He says, I didn't want any of it. I did not desire all this judgment I had to prophesy of. No, my desire was that Judah would repent and be spared it. But instead, he says, verse 17, you are my hope in the day of doom. And so now he finds refuge here. Verse 18, let them be ashamed to persecute me, but do not let me be ashamed or me be put to shame. Let them be dismayed, but do not let me be dismayed. Bring on them the day of doom and destroy them with double destruction. Now listen, hold this thought. You might go, wow. Man, Jeremiah, that's pretty tough prayer. Pretty tough prayer? You just wait. Wait until the end of chapter 18. Man, you're going to see a tough prayer. So just hold your thought there. But the basic idea was in verse 18, do not let me be put to shame. Lord, this is my desire. This is my refuge. That my ministry would not be compromised by me being embarrassed or losing confidence in it. Going on out of chapter 17, verse 19, We see something interesting. It's a section where Jeremiah seems to break away from the prophecy and sort of tell a story. Look at it here, verse 19. Thus the Lord said to me, go stand in the gate of the children of the people by which the kings of Judah come in and by which they go out and in all the gates of Jerusalem and say to them, hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem who enter by these gates. Thus says the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. But they did not obey, nor incline their ear, but made their necks stiff that they might not hear instruction. God told Jeremiah, go down to one of the gates of the city and tell everybody, tell the kings and the commoners together, this is the message you're supposed to give to them. Hey, everybody, get back to keeping the Sabbath. Because apparently in Jeremiah's day, they had neglected the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath commands come all the way back from the Old Testament, especially with the law of Israel. And I won't get into the whole law of Exodus and all that. But God simply commanded them, keep the Sabbath day. And by Jeremiah's day, they had not done it. And what God basically did for Judah at this time was he gave them a test case. He goes, you know what? Let me just give you one area to obey me in. If you would obey me in this one single area, maybe I would hold back my hand of judgment. Let's not make it all complicated. Let's not make you repent about everything all at once. I'm going to test you in one area this Sabbath. And if you keep the Sabbath, maybe I will relent from my things. But look what happens. Verse 24. And it shall be. If you heed me carefully, says the Lord, to bring no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day and do no work in it, 
Then shall enter the gates of the city kings and princes sitting on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, and their princes accompanied by the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And this city shall remain forever. And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places around Jerusalem and from the land of Benjamin and from the lowland, the mountains and from the south, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offerings and incense, bringing sacrifices of praise to the house of the Lord. But... If you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. See what God did? Israel, let's just make it real simple for you. Forget about all those other commands. Forget about the idolatry. Forget about it all. Let's just boil it down to one thing. Why don't you just start obeying me on the Sabbath? Does it seem strange to you that God would boil it all down to one thing? And in some measures, not even that big of a thing. Listen, there were worse sins that Judah committed than breaking the Sabbath. Offering their children to Molech was a worse sin than breaking the Sabbath. But why did God bring it down to one sin? Friends, He brought it down to one sin in the garden, didn't he? And it's as if he's offering that choice all over to him again. Look, forget about all those other things. Why don't you obey me just in one point? And I will bless you so abundantly if you do that. I will turn back the judgment that I have pronounced. And you'll reign forever. And you know what? They didn't keep it. Isn't that strange? Doesn't that show the weakness of man? And, and the rebellion of Israel, that they simply could not do it when God boiled it down to one thing for them to do. Now on into chapter 18. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make. So it's like a field trip day for Jeremiah. Jeremiah, object lesson day, go down to the potter's house. And he goes down to the potter's house, and he sees the potter at work. Potter throws the clay on the wheel, you know, and he's spinning the wheel with his foot and he's molding it and he's shaping it. And the clay, the clay is being fashioned and molded just the way he wants it. And then for some reason, for somehow, the, the clay somehow becomes uncooperative. So what does he do? Friends, he doesn't just take the lump of clay and throw it out the window. He smashes it and he says, I'm not going to make it that. I'll make it this. I will use it, but in a different way. That's what he says in verse 4. The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel. Some people think that the whole lesson of Jeremiah at the potter's house is that God can smash the clay and throw it away anything he wants. That's not it. It's that if the clay is, so to speak, uncooperative, God will shape it into a different form. God's going to get his use out of the clay. You better believe it. But how he uses it will depend somewhat on how it allows itself to be shaped. Verse 5. The word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, the clay is in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and plant it, if it does evil in my sight that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Don't you see what God's saying in this? He's saying, Israel... Can I not do with you as the potter does to the clay? Now, can I just say something? This is very important. Whenever we use an analogy of God or his workings with man, or whenever God uses an analogy, the analogy breaks down at some place or another. We can't extend the analogy endlessly. Um, God says we are his sheep. Sheep can't talk to the shepherd, therefore God does not want us to talk to him. 
You, you know what I mean? You, you can take these illustrations that God uses and extend them beyond their intended purpose and meaning. But, but the intended purpose and meaning in this is clear enough. He says, listen, verse 8. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from evil, I will relent. So God's saying to Judah, I have told you that judgment is coming and you can't stop it. But it's almost as if it's when I say that my fingers are crossed behind my back. If you would truly repent as God offered them to do on the Sabbath, I would relent and I am free to do that because I am the potter. But just because I have promised blessing to a nation, just because I have blessed a nation in the past, they better not believe that they're going to be blessed by God forever. Friends, that's kind of a frightening thing for the United States of America, isn't it? We, uh, we have been a blessed nation of God. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it at all. When you see what, what I believe to be the hand of God throughout history, and, and let me just say this, I don't believe that the hand of God is evident only. Like, God cares about America and he doesn't care about other nations. That's foolish. I think God's hand is discernible in the way that he moves throughout all the nations of the world. But, but I think that God has had a wonderful and a powerful blessing upon America. But God forbid if we think that that's going to last forever. Especially if the nation turns their back on him. God says, I'm free to turn it. I'm the potter on the wheel. And if the clay just becomes rebellious and uncooperative to me, man, I'll shape it into something else. This is what he's saying. The lesson of the potter's house was not primarily... God can do whatever he wants. The main lesson is that God is free to respond to his people according to their own moral conduct and choices. And his previous promises do not restrict his ability to do so. If God has promised blessing in the past, he may bring judgment in the future if they become wicked. If God has promised uh, judgment in the future, he may relent from that and bring blessing if they turn to him. Because he is the potter and he is free to do so. Verse 11. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone, from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. It's like after the whole thing with the potter, he says, Okay, here's my offer to you. I have told you that judgment is coming. Here's your offer to repent. By the way, there's a very interesting thing there. Look at verse 11. Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. That word fashioning uses the same ancient Hebrew word as for how the potter shaped the clay in the previous verses. It's a very deliberate link. God's saying, I'm, you're on the potter's wheel. I'm fashioning things. I'm shaping them. But the point is this, verse 11 Return now, everyone, from his way and make your ways and your doings good. This is to be an encouragement. The lesson of the potter's wheel is not this. God's going to do whatever he's going to do. He's the potter and, oh, I'm just the clay. Oh, he wants to smash me, he smashes me, whatever. That's not the idea. No, it's that God will respond to the clay as it works in his hands. And he will relent from his judgment if the people give him a reason to do so. Now look at verse 12. And they said, that is hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans and we will every one obey the dictates of his evil heart. Oh, friends, doesn't that just pain you, that response in verse 12? That is hopeless. So we'll walk along our own plans. Judah was in the tragic place of feeling that it was hopeless to repent. It did not feel hopeless because they were afraid God wouldn't keep up his end of the bargain. No, it seemed hopeless because honestly, friends, they just simply did not feel it was worth it to change the dictates of their evil hearts just because one prophet told them so. Look, the... There's something I haven't told you much about here in the book of Jeremiah because we haven't run up against it. And I almost feel bad for not mentioning it before. Jeremiah was one prophetic voice. 
And as far as we know, there were not other prophets giving the same message as Jeremiah. Now, maybe there were, we just don't know anything about them. But we know that there were a lot of supposed prophets of the Lord who spoke the opposite of what Jeremiah said. You see, Jeremiah's message was, get ready for judgment, the Babylonians are coming. And what the other false prophets said was, hey man, don't worry about it. The Babylonians aren't stronger than God. God will deliver us from the Babylonians. Don't worry about it at all. That was the message of the false prophets. When they heard Jeremiah's stern message, repent because judgment is sure. And when they heard the message of the false prophets, hey, don't sweat it, man, everything's cool. Which message do you think attracted more people? And so Jeremiah's in this place where he delivers this message. And they go, man, it's hopeless to repent. Come on. Why, why are you so bound up here, Jeremiah? Relax a little bit. So starting out, verse 13. Therefore, thus says the Lord. Ask now among the Gentiles, who has heard such things? The virgin of Israel has done a very horrible thing. Which man, will a man leave the snow water of Lebanon, which comes from the rock of the field? Will the cold flowing waters be forsaken for strange waters? Because my people have forgotten me. They have burned incense to worthless idols and they have caused themselves to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in pathways and not in a highway to make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing. Everyone who passes by it will be astonished and shake his head. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. God says, ask now among the Gentiles who's heard such things. When a God offered the people a way back, he offered them the opportunity to repent and to hold back the hand of judgment. And everybody says, ah, forget it, it's hopeless, who cares? Who's heard of such a thing? It's outrageous, God is saying. I will send the judgment. And friends, in all the book of Jeremiah, I don't know if you will find a stronger statement of judgment than what we read in verse 17. Would you look at that with me? Just that one line. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of calamity. God commanded the priests of Israel to bless the people of Israel. He said, so shall you raise your hands and bless them. And part of the priestly blessing that God gave them to put and to pronounce over Israel was that the Lord would make his face to shine upon them. The face of God shining upon them meant he looked upon you and smiled. His favor was with you. And this is what God was saying. Judah, when the Babylonians come, I'm going to turn my back. You're not going to see my face. I'm just going to turn my back to you. you you're going to cry out, God, please look upon us. My back's going to be turned to you. God, please, look at my family. It's being destroyed. My back's going to be turned to you. Now is the time when you have my attention. It's not hopeless, but it will be on that day. What a tragic, tragic statement. Verse 18. Then they said, come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us attack him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. Oh, now the other prophets, the religious uh, aristocracy, the powers that be, the man, they're after Jeremiah. And they're just rubbing their hands. Let's go. Let's get after him. And they say there in verse 18, the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Hey, listen, Jeremiah, we, we've got the, the, the prophet. We got the priest. We got the wise man. We got it together, man. We got the revelation from God. We don't need you at all. Don't try to tell us what's going on. And friends, here's, here's the tragedy of it. If a man held the title of priest, he was supposed to have the law, but they didn't. If a man held the title or was considered to be wise, he must have good counsel, but they didn't have good counsel. If they were called a prophet, they must have a word from God. 
And this was a mentality that pretty much said, well, we got priests, aren't they good enough? We, we got prophets, aren't they swell? We, we got wise men, don't they tell us what's good? And no, they didn't tell them what was good. They were corrupt, all of them. Matter of fact, there's a later prophet, Ezekiel, who would state this in the reverse. He says this, quote, then they will seek a vision from the prophet, but the law will perish from the priest and counsel from the elders. It'll be gone on every front. And so what do they say? Verse 18, come, let us attack him with the tongue and let us not give heed to any of his words. We're going to attack him. We're, we're going we're to just cut him up with our tongues. Let's get to work against him. Now, remember that really tough part of Jeremiah's prayer? Fasten your seatbelt here. Start at verse 19. Ready for this? Give heed to me, O Lord. And listen to the voice of those who contend with me. Shall evil be repaid for good? For they've dug a pit for my life. Remember that I stood before you to speak good for them. To turn away your wrath from them. Okay, stop at verse 20. Don't read to verse 21. Eyes up here, people. <laughs> Verses 19 and 20. You, he's just heartbroken, isn't he? Lord, I prayed for them. Lord, I defended them before you. I've been doing this for them. I don't hate them. I love them. I don't want evil to come upon them. I've been contending for them. Verse 20, remember that I stood before you to speak good for them. God, you know how I've tried. You know how I've cared for my people and wanted to defend them and wanted to help them. Lord, you know. Verse 21, you ready for this? Therefore, deliver up their children to the famine. And pour out their blood by the force of the sword. Let their wives become widows and bereaved of their children. Let their men be put to death. Their young men be slain by the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard from their houses when you bring a troop suddenly upon them. For they have dug a pit to take me and hidden snares from my feet. Yet, Lord, you know all their counsel which is against me to slay me. Provide no atonement for their iniquity, nor blot out their sin from your sight, but let them be overthrown before you. Deal thus with them in the time of your anger. Friends, that's one of the most violent prayers of the Bible right there. What do we make of such a prayer? Well, first of all, these are people that have deliberately tried to thwart and stop Jeremiah's ministry. And I don't think it's wrong to say that he's venting. But can I tell you something? He's venting in exactly the right place. If you're going to pray a prayer and think thoughts of such utter destruction of your enemies, the best way for you to deal with those thoughts is to package them in a prayer and present them to God. Uh, look at what he says there at the very end. It's in verse 23. Deal thus with them in the time of your anger. In other words, God, you do this. I'm not going to do it. I don't mean to sound, you know, grotesque or controversial. But Jeremiah was not going to take a sword and cut somebody's head off and say, I do this in the glory of Yahweh. But what he was going to say, God, I want vengeance upon these people, Lord but I'm going to leave it in your hands. Now, I don't know if you have an enemy. I don't know if you have somebody who pretty much hates you or you hate them. But if you do, let me tell you two things to do. First of all, would you just believe what the Lord says when he says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord? It belongs to the Lord. And didn't Jeremiah know that? That's why he prayed the prayer. That, that's why he's not forming a hit squad against these guys. He's just saying, Lord, I give it to you. I lay it down to you. So follow the pattern of Jeremiah. Say, vengeance is yours, says the Lord. I commit it to you, Lord. It's your business. That's what you learned from Jeremiah. Now, can I tell you what you learned from Jesus? Jesus. Jesus told you to pray for your enemies and persecutors. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, Jeremiah prayed for them. No, don't pray like that for them. Although, if you've got to let it out, let it out. 
Why don't you think now about that person who hates you or you hate them? And why don't you just pray for God's blessing in their life and see what God does to work in their life and in yours. Father, that's our prayer. I pray that not a single person among us, not a single person who uh, listens to this as a later time, would be bound by the shackles of hatred. Lord, we want to learn from Jeremiah to commit all vengeance unto you. But even more so, we want to learn from Jesus to pray for good and blessing towards those who hate us, or frankly, Lord, we hate them. And ask that you give us that freedom, that power, that liberty. Thank you, Lord. And turn our hearts towards you, that we would be able to be shaped into the best vessel possible upon your wheel. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.